Good evening. My name is Heather Belgian with the YSU Office of Alumni and Events. Welcome to tonight's alumni lecture series program, Refugees, Myths and Realities. Our speaker this evening will be Dr. Nicole Pettit, who is an assistant professor in the YSU Department of English. Dr. Pettit has been teaching and researching within refugee background communities for over 20 years. She is the coordinator of the Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages K-12 Licensure Endorsement Program at YSU. As you have questions this evening, please write those in the Facebook comments. Dr. Pettit will take questions following the conclusion of her lecture, and her contact information will also be shared in the comments at the end of this video. Dr. Pettit, thank you for sharing your knowledge about a topic that we hear about in the news and in conversation, but often don't have a deep understanding of. Welcome. Heather, thank you so much for that introduction. That was great. I hardly need to introduce myself now. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen and I have a point presentation to um, share with everyone this evening. So let me line that up here. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us for this conversation. I see a lot of familiar names in the Facebook chat and unfortunately I can't have that on at the same time as I'm speaking um, or our sound will get messed up, but um, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Before we get started or as we're getting started, one of the first questions I want to address is why is an English professor talking about refugee issues? So first of all, those who know me know that I'm not a typical English um, faculty member. My field is applied linguistics, not literature or film or poetry or many of the things that are commonly associated with English. My professional background is that I formerly taught English as a new language to newcomers to the United States as well as Spanish. And I started that work in the late 1990s. In 2001, I began working with Somali refugees in my hometown of Minneapolis. And that was my first experience working with refugees. And I realized that I needed to learn more about the experiences that my students were having prior to arriving and as they first arrived in the United States so that I could be a better teacher and a better support to uh, my colleagues as well. Um, and so, as I learned, I, I realized that there were many opportunities arriving in my lab to share what I was learning with people around me, with friends, um, colleagues, family members, um, as people were trying to make sense of what they heard on TV or what they heard other people say. So my job throughout the years um, has been mostly um, teaching and teacher development. And then, of course, I've gone to graduate school and I've done research um, with refugee background um, language learners. Um, primarily in Minneapolis, and then I was in Atlanta for five years doing my PhD, and now I'm here in Northeast Ohio. I just finished my stint as the chair of the Refugee Concerns Interest Section of one of my professional organizations. And if you're interested in refugee issues at all, I encourage you to connect with their Facebook page. Even though that organization is related to teaching English, the Facebook page for Refugee Concerns is a wonderful resource for refugee issues. And I have shared with Heather a link to a Google Doc that you can access and that has that um, a link to that Facebook page on it and a bunch of other links that we're going to be talking about tonight. So immigration processes, including refugee processes, are very, very complex. There's a lot that we could talk about tonight that we're not going to get to not just because of time, but because I'm not an immigration lawyer and I, I don't wanna to try to pretend to be one, okay? Um, there are a lot of special situations that I'm not gonna get into tonight. Um, people who are um, very versed in these, um, in refugee issues might notice, like I'm not addressing unaccompanied minors, temporary protected status, victims of trafficking, the Cuban-Haitian program, all of these things I'm leaving to the side so that I can focus our time on um, developing basic understandings to begin to lay a foundation for understanding current events and social issues and immigration policies surrounding refugees. So what we're going to be focusing in on tonight are the kinds of things that you would hear about if you were going to start volunteering at an organization that was serving newly arrived refugees. These are the kinds of things that organizations like that might focus on. In fact, 
that's how I got this idea. I worked at an organization and we did this kind of training um, with our volunteers. So my hope is that our conversation tonight isn't that you're thinking of this not as an endpoint, but as a beginning or for some of you who are more um, experienced um, intermediate point on your path. So in true academic style, um, I need to let you know where things are coming from. So all of the images in this presentation are either um, in the public domain or they're permitted for use under the following Creative Commons license. So um, yes, this is the kind of thing that I ask my students to do. <laughs> um, and I also want you to know that I'm gonna be sharing a lot of um, numbers and data. And all of the numbers and data this evening come from government sources or from the United Nations, specifically the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, or the UNHCR. We're going to be talking about them a lot tonight. And all of the links to all of the data are in the Google Doc. So every single data point that you hear tonight has backup to it. Okay, this is again the kind of thing that I ask for my students, back up every single claim that you make. So every single data point, you can go and look up those, those data on your own. Um, I also want to point out that um, I'm not using a lot of pictures. Um, one of the reasons is because, well, two reasons. <laughs> um, one of the things that happens sometimes in media representations of refugees is that refugees um, can be, the research tells us that refugees tend to be either um, portrayed as villains or as victims. And it's very difficult for us to see images, media images or images online that represent the full breadth of human experience. And so I purposely have shied away from using um, any images so that we don't fall down into any of those traps. And then the other thing that I wanna say about all of these numbers that I'm sharing um, is that, um, each one of them represents a human life. So even though we're looking at graphs and we're looking at tables, um, and I say something like 30,000 or 50,000 or 100,000, every single one of those numbers is a human. And so I just want us to keep that in mind because it's very easy to get just sort of into this, the technical piece of it. So let's move along. Um, so to start out, um, I just want to focus for a second on some terms. So. Um, when we're talking about refugee issues, we're talking about migration. So I want to point out the terms that we're talking about are used differently, can be used differently in different parts of the English speaking world. So I'm going to be um, talking about these, how they're used in the United States. But if you go and travel to London or Australia, you might hear these terms used in different ways. But in the US, we're usually safe with what we're talking about tonight. So migration is just simply moving from one place to another. Um, we might have migration that's domestic or international. So an, an example of domestic migration would be when I moved from my hometown of Minneapolis to Atlanta for a PhD, and then from Atlanta um, up to Youngstown, Ohio. An example of international migration would be my colleague who moved from the US to Ireland for a job. Okay, we can also think about migration in terms of voluntary migration or involuntary migration. So um, during the Q&A, if you'd like, we can talk about how these things are not necessarily, they're presented as separate things, but there's actually um, frequently some overlap between them. It's not always so clear what's voluntary and involuntary. But for the, for the time being, let's look at these this way. An example of voluntary migration might be, I chose. I decided that I wanted to go somewhere and I, Put the wheels in motion and I went. Okay, so let's say we've got, um, you know, a, a student at YSU who goes on study abroad to Paris and meets the love of their life and gets engaged and comes back to the US and says, now I want to bring my fiance here so that we can get married in the United States. Okay, well, there's such a thing as a fiance visa, right? And so the fiance they do the applications, they go through the processes and the fiance comes and they get married. Okay, it's not quite that simple, but for the sake of time. And so maybe there's some negotiation there about are we gonna live in France or are we gonna live in the United States? But it's it's not um, uh, it's not really a, a life and death sort of matter. Um, in the case of involuntary or forced migration, this would be where people are forced to leave their homes. Um, we, the, another term for this is forced displacement. There are a lot of different conditions that might lead to that. Two of the very common ones that we hear about a lot are war and persecution. Okay. 
There are a number of different things that can come out of involuntary or forced displacement. Three of the most common are first someone being internally displaced or seeking asylum or becoming an asylum seeker actually or being a refugee. So here's how I wanna think about this. People who are internally displaced are forcibly moved from their homes, but internal displacement, it's a domestic migration. So that's up here. In the case of asylum seekers and refugees, that would be a case of international migration. So there, there's some overlap here in the experiences um, or the definitions of asylum seekers and refugees, and sometimes in experiences as well. Um, and we will sort of sift and sort those out as we go. Okay. So sometimes my clicker works and sometimes it doesn't. Here we go. All right. <laughs> so in terms of numbers, this is where um, we stand according to the UNHCR. Right now worldwide, there are 71 million people that have been forcibly displaced from their homes. It's the largest number since World War II. And the way that breaks up is um, predominantly folks are internally displaced. So they're moving from one place to another within their country. And then the number is lower for asylum seekers and then um, stands around 25.9 million for um, refugees. And these are folks that are under the um, working with the UNHCR for um, potential resettlement. And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so what is this refugee definition? Okay, so the definition of refugee was initiated in via um, international law with the United Nations in 1951. So I want to read it. I don't, don't normally read off my PowerPoints, but <laughs> we're going to do it this time. So someone who is unable or, un or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. So that's a lot. That's a lot that's going on. So I want to break that down. Okay. Breaking it down, a refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution, number one. Number two, the fear is based on unchangeable traits, race, religion, nationality, et cetera, et cetera. They are outside of the country of his or her nationality. That's what makes this international migration and unable or unwilling to call upon the protection of their country usually due to the, that, that fear that they have of persecution. So why would this be? I mean, I've grown up in the United States and I've really not had any moments where I'm actually fearful of for my life um, when it's related um, to like federal law, for example. And, um, <clears throat> and so you could say this, like one case of this is, so you belong to a political party and there is a regime change. And the new um, political system is, let's say, militarily antagonistic to the political party that used to be in power that you belonged to. After that shift in power, it might not be safe for you because you were registered under the old regime as being participating. It might not be safe for you to stay where you are any longer. Okay, so these these criteria are the same for asylees and refugees. And we're gonna get to later, like what sets those two groups apart. Okay, so what, I've, um, what I wanna point out here is that this definition came about in Geneva in 1951. So what, what was going on in 1951? Those of you who remember your history classes, remember that this was the end of World War II. So there was a movement amongst the international community to establish a formalized mechanism for the resettlement of the large number of people that needed, that had been forcibly displaced as a result of World War II, during and as a result of World War II. Um, there has been, and I have the entire protocol linked into the Google Doc. There's been an amendment in 1967, and then there was one more piece that was added on a little bit later. So the original protocol covered um, World War II, and then the amendment in 1967 um, covered more broadly because the political situations had changed worldwide. Okay, so a I wanna point out also that there were 145 um, country, countries or states that signed on to this protocol and that the United States was 
foundational in um, the establishment of this protocol. It's part of our heritage in the United States to um, that we were part of, of putting this forward in this humanitarian effort on an international scale. Okay, so you've got three numbers here and um, those numbers represent the number of people that are forcibly displaced in three different locations. They are the three largest numbers of um, refugees that are in, a cer in certain countries. So there is a country that has 3.7 million people that are forcibly displaced within its numbers, and that's the number one country that has forcibly displaced folks there. And then there's another country that has 1.4 and another country that has 1.2. And I just wanna give you a chance in the Facebook chat to say what countries you think that those might be. I wish that I were on the Facebook, could be on the Facebook chat with you to see what you're putting in there. <laughs> so do you think this is, um, you know, the United States and Canada, Australia, Sweden, Italy, Germany, these are all countries that tend to receive um, refugees. And for those of you who saw the teaser video last night, you might have some ideas. Okay, well, I don't even know if you're guessing. If you're like the students in my classroom, you're probably not guessing, but I hope you are guessing. <laughs> I always tell them it's okay. I promise I'm not giving you a grade. So anyone who's watching this, I promise I'm not giving you a grade. <laughs> okay, so these, these countries are Turkey, Pakistan, and Uganda. Okay, so frequently when I share this kind of information, folks are surprised. But let's think about this for a second. If you had to leave your home unexpectedly, where would you go? Probably to the, the place that's closest. Like I have for most of my life lived fairly close to Canada. So if I had to pack up a suitcase and I had to go because it wasn't safe for me to be here in the US any longer, I would probably go to Canada. So Turkey, as we know, is close to Syria. And as we know from um, the media, there have been um, lots of folks displaced out of Syria over the course of the last um, five or more years. I can't even remember what year we're in anymore, but that's been going on for quite a while. Um, and Turkey has received many, many people from Syria. Um, and if we, if we broke out our maps, we would see similar things um, with Pakistan and Uganda as well. So it's very common for um, countries to, re if there's unrest around you, um, it's common for you to um, receive forcibly dis displaced folks in your country. Okay, so what about the US? Okay, so the US didn't show up on that, <laughs> on that, on those numbers. So before we talk about um, where the US stands in relationship to other countries in terms of receiving um, refugees, I just wanna go back for a second. I wanna point out these numbers are um, forcibly dis people that are forcibly displaced. And remember, not every forcibly displaced person fits into the definition of refugee, okay? So we're moving now from forcibly displaced to actual refugee numbers um, in a moment. But first, we're gonna talk about who decides, who decides these things, okay? So who decides how many refugees are admitted to the US? Do you think it's A, the president in consultation with state governors, or B, the president in consultation with Congress? Again, you can put this in the Facebook chat and I promise I'm not gonna grade you. I can't even see you. I can't even see who's putting what. <laughs> okay, so hopefully a couple people have made some guesses. Heather, have anyone, has anyone made a guess? No, they're not guessing. All right, okay. <laughs> Usually, technically, it's the president in consultation with Congress. Now, we've got a caveat for 2020. There was an executive order signed in September um, of last year, and this is the name of it, Enhancing State and Local Involvement in Refugee Resettlement. The title of it is a little bit misleading because state and local entities are already involved in refugee resettlement. What makes this executive order different, and I wanna make sure I get my language right here, is that state and local governments need to now consent to receiving refugees. Um, basically states and local jurisdictions could deny refugees entry, okay? So that's what makes this um, things a little bit different starting this year in the 2020 fiscal year. Okay, how often is the cap set? Every four years when the president takes office or every year? If you're not gonna guess on Facebook, guess in your brain. <laughs> It'll make this less boring, I promise. <laughs> okay, so this is every year, no caveats, that's still in place. Okay, true or false? 
The president also sets caps on refugee admissions from particular regions of the world. So, you know, if the number is 30,000, you know, 10,000 from Asia, 7,000 from Africa, 2,000 from Latin America, et cetera. Does this happen? True. But again, there's a caveat this year. <laughs> so this year, the 2020 caveat is um, that um, normally in this table, what you would see is you would see like Asia and a number, Africa and a number, et cetera. Um, but what we're seeing here is that um, certain populations of special humanitarian concern have been identified and allocations have been given in that way. The total um, for 2020 is 18,000. Um, admit like the cap, the cap is um, 18,000. Um, what I want to point out here is something that that's really interesting is that um, this category right here at the top, the refugees who have been persecuted or have a well founded fear of persecution based on religion. So what's what's interesting about this is that that is already in the definition in international law and in domestic law. Okay, so the refugee. Um, I'm blanking on the exact name, but it was um, the Refugee Act in 1980. It's linked to um, the Google in the Google Doc. You can look at the actual wording of the law. I've linked to the actual law so that you can look at it. So religion is already in that category. And so what's what appears to be happening here is that there is like a like an extra emphasis, I guess, on um, persecution based on religion during this fiscal year. And then there are a number of different categories. I would say that the El Salvador, Guatemala, or Honduras is probably, and this one, Iraqi refugees with certain US ties is are probably the two exceptions to the based on region. Although it's uncommon, I haven't seen in the past um, where there, where the president is actually listing countries. It's usually every one of these I've seen, it has been um, regions rather than countries. Okay, moving along. Oh, I almost forgot. It's a good thing I've got the PowerPoint to remind me. Just because these are listed as, you know, religion is one, Iraqi is two, El Salvador, Central America, countries are three, etc. That doesn't mean that's how it's allocated. So, um, or how it's prioritized. So we've got this certain allocation, but within the allocation, what are the priorities? Those are set as well. So you could, if you wanted to, this link is here, but it's also in the Google Doc that you can actually look and see how these are being prioritized. Okay, next, true or false, the US cap on refugees has been growing in recent years. So the president in consultation with Congress or this last year in consultation with state and local government, like the numbers have been going up in terms of the cap. Okay, again, if you're not gonna guess online, guess in your brain. <laughs> and that is false. Before I show you the data, I wanna, I wanna do the next question. And that is the US frequently it's, exceeds its cap on refugees. So if the cap is set, again, let's say, you know, the cap this year is set at 18,000. So is there an expectation that, you know, it would be normal for us to go to like 19 or 20,000 or 25 or 30, um, even though the cap's at 18? So do we, do we do this frequently? Yes or no? Okay, so the answer to that one is false as well. So let's, let's dig into the data. Okay, I know some people don't like graphs. So let me break this down for you. What we're looking at is this blue line. It starts in 1980. Right, which is when the um, the US law was put into place. I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of that. <laughs> I refer to it so frequently too. Okay, and so the blue number is the annual cap. And so you see it um, start a little over 220,000 and you see it dip in the mid eighties and you see it going back up again. Overall though, from here to here, that's an overall trend downward of, since 1980. And then the orange is the number of admitted refugees. There are two times right here, I believe this is 1982, and this was 2016. Those are both anomalies. I believe this, I, you know what, I haven't double checked and I don't wanna speak wrong, but I know that those, those are both anomalies and special situations that came about. But since 1980, I was only able to find in the data two times that we went slightly over the cap by small numbers. Um, so you see some ups and downs here. This of course, was right after 9-11. And so what happened was that everything sort of got put on pause. Okay, the folks involved in the events of 9-11 were not part of the refugee vetting process at all. Um, that wasn't the system that they came to the United States through. Um, so I just sometimes there's confusion about that. So I just wanna make sure that, that people are clear about that. Um, but what happened, 
like overall was that there was a lot of unknown, right? And so there was a lot of stuff that just sort of stopped for a year. I, I couldn't give you the number of months precisely, but um, some of the interviewing stopped. There's a lot of interviewing that happens internationally with um, people who are applying to be refugees or get resettled, I mean. Um, and so some of that interviewing stopped. Um, there were different vetting processes that were um, needed to be put in place. And so as you see some of that um, happen, although the cap stayed flat, you see that the admissions start to um, rise again. And then we see a peak here in 2016, and then we see some drops. Okay, so in terms of raw numbers though, we see, okay, we're gonna go back. So if this is constantly dropping, what is what are we hearing about in the media where people say, but the United States, United States accepts, you know, has the biggest refugee program in the world. Okay, so let's look at some numbers again. This starts in 20, um, 2004, it goes to 2018. And this is number of refugees resettled in thousands. So in 2004, the blue line is the United States. We resettled 53,000. Again, we see this peak up here in 2016 at 97,000. And you see all along the way, even though our, our caps and our admissions have been going down, you see us you know, above other folks, right? Other countries until 2018, it's the first year that the United States dipped below Canada and we've continued to dip below Canada because our numbers, um, 2018 was 23,000 and then 2019, I believe was lower again. And then 2020 now is 18,000. So we've, we've gone you know, steadily down in the last couple of years. So one of the things I wanna point out here is from 2012 to 2017, we saw this um, increase in the number of refugees um, in the country, right? And so we at um, around 2017, we were at about 929,000, a little bit over almost 930,000 refugees inside the United States. And this was, you know, in five years, that's kind of, you know, a big increase. So um, in raw numbers, that's what that looks like. But let's talk about percentages for a second. So how do we compare with other countries taking into account the overall population? So if we're thinking about percentage wise, rather than raw numbers, are we in the top 10? Are we in the top 25? Or are we in the top 50? Think about it in your brain. <laughs> okay, so we are in the top 50. Where this is um, USA, Egypt, Malaysia, Somalia are actually at the same um, percentage rate of the number of um, folks forcibly displaced in the country. Okay, so the largest would be um, this was from this is um, based on 2017, the end of 2017 data, data was Lebanon. Okay, so how do we, where do we stand? Who are our like cousins in this, right? So US, Egypt, Malaysia, Somalia all have 0.2%. So that 929,000 that we see here, 929,825, that accounts for 0.2% um, or accounted for at the time this happened, the data was collected for 0.2% of the US population. Um, so, making my clicker work again here. <laughs> so um, in terms of the top 10, um, we have got, let's see, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Chad, Uganda, Sweden. Okay, so sometimes this list is a little bit surprising to people, but again, if we keep in mind the, um, that folks are initially migrating to countries that are nearby them, it, it can make a lot of sense. Okay, so, that said, how do people actually get here, right? So we've named all these different countries um, that are participating in refugee resettlement. How does somebody actually get from point A to point B? Who's involved? Okay, so we've got, hmm, we're gonna do a little case study of um, someone that I'm gonna call Ayan. I don't have anyone specific in mind, but we're gonna assume that Ayan has three children and that she's from Somalia. And, um, some of you might remember that um, um, a civil war began in Somalia in the early 1990s, and there's been political instability for 30 or so years. And during this time, hundreds of thousands of people have left Somalia. There's about 2.6 million Somalis internally displaced. Um, so 
Let's assume that Ayan and, um, has decided with her three children that it's not safe for them to stay in Somalia. And so for those of you who could use a little ge geography refresher, here's Somalia on the Horn of Africa with lots of beautiful beaches and wonderful tropical climate and just wonderful food. Um, so let's assume, though, unfortunately, that Ayan needs to leave. And neighboring countries, there's my arrow, neighboring countries are here, Ethiopia, here, Kenya, and they decide to go to the Kenya Dadaab camp. This is an image of the Dadaab camp. You can get an idea of the size. It's actually a complex of three different camps um, operated, operated by the UNHCR, the High Commissioner on Refugees. And at the end of March 2020, I looked up so that I could share with you, um, there were 217, 511 registered refugees and asylum seekers um, in this camp. You can also see from the images that this isn't something that's meant to be a permanent dwelling, although um, Dadaab is one of the camps that has been around since the um, early 90s-ish. And um, there are families that are now on their third generation living in the camp. So one generation came, had children, those children grew up in the camp, they have um, gotten married, had children, and now their children are growing up in the camp as well. Um, but let's let's assume that that is not Ayan's case, okay? So when Ayan arrives at Dadaab, she has to register with the UNHCR. There's a couple of things that can happen next. Um, we're going to assume that she isn't in Dadaab indefinitely, okay? So um, she might be encouraged to move back to Somalia. UNHCR might encourage her to resettle in her country of migration, or they might determine that she's eligible to resettle in the third country. In order for that to happen, she needs to be considered amongst the most vulnerable um, of, of refugee or of asylum seeking populations. Okay, so assuming that she is um, determined to be amongst the most vulnerable, what are her chances of being resettled as of 2018? This is again from the UNHCR data. Do you think it's less than 5% chance, around 20% chance of being resettled or greater than 50% chance? Okay, it is less than 5% chance. And this is something, something else that tends to be surprising to folks. Maybe to some of you, it's not surprising at all, um, but there are many, many more people um, eligible for resettlement and waiting for resettlement than um, there is actual movement in, in through the programs. But let's assume that Ayan is one of the lucky ones and the UNHCR refers her to the United States rather than referring her to Sweden or Australia. No one is gonna force her. If they say, hey, you're, you're, we have you um, designated to go to the US. If she says, I don't wanna go to the US, she, no one's gonna force her to go to the US. However, her options may be limited. And so saying, I don't wanna go to the US or if they said, you're going to Sweden and she says, I wanna go to the US, there may or may not be space for her. Um, but so let's assume, though, that she um, that she gets referred to the U.S. And when that happens, her case enters something that's called the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. And I have a link to that in the Google Doc. And her case is referred to what's called a refugee support center. And those are managed and funded by the U.S. State Department, um, the Bureau of Population Migration. I always get their name wrong. <laughs> I'm going to leave. Oh, wait, here we go. Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. I always put migration before refugees. Um, and so um, the State Department um, um, works with NGOs, international organizations, or U.S. embassy contractors for the refugee for their resettlement support centers. Um, and if they determine it's time to move forward, they start doing some pre-screening and they start um, biographic checks with her. So I didn't get into, this is already a ton of information, so I didn't get into all of the nitty gritty of all of the checks that happen, but it's those are linked in the Google Doc. If you wanna get into the very nitty gritty of every single test that happens and when it happens and by whom, you're welcome to do that. There's a lot there. But what I will say is that um, Ayan will be vetted by the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the Department of Defense, and the National Counterterrorism Center in addition to the, her regular State Department um, State Department checks. So then she moves to, um, assuming everything is moving along, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, they review her biographic and biometric checks, they interview her. If there's more checks that are needed, 
they initiate those, and then they make a determination on her form I-590. And that form is the form where you apply to say, hey, can I be a refugee and come to the United States? I have linked that exact form in the Google Docs. If you wanna see what somebody puts on their form I-590, you can see it there. They don't make a determination on this form until after all of the checks are cleared. But let's assume that everything is moving forward well with Ayan's case. If it's approved, then the Refugee um, Service Center processes Ayan for travel. They help her get a loan from the International Organization of Migration because she is going to have to pay back her travel and the travel of her children. Um, they arrange for her health screening. The goal is no contagious diseases coming into the US. So the idea that like, oh, some refugees brought in a certain disease, unlikely. Also in Ohio, um, folks have an extra health screening after they arrive. So, um, and then the RSC secures a domestic resettlement agency sponsor for her as well. We're gonna talk about those in a second. Finally, Customs and Border Control has, has their own set of um, checks that they do, right? So they receive flight manifests prior to refugees flying. And so they can do um, any checks they need to do. They conduct additional screening of ION prior to boarding. They determine if ION is admissible to the US and if yes, they admit ION to the US. So what does that mean? Anyone who's traveled internationally knows that when you come back into the US, you go through Customs and Border Control. Like your plane arrives, but you're like technically in the country after you go through Customs and Border Control, right? So at at that border point, that's when they say, yes, you're in the country. Okay. So true or false, refugees are undocumented. Some people use the term illegal immigrant or illegal alien. That's not the term that I use. I use the term undocumented. But for those of you who might be unfamiliar with the term undocumented, that's, um, that's what that term refers to. So sometimes I hear people say like, um, make statements about refugees in their documentation and, and a claim that they're illegal immigrants. So this is false. Obviously, there's a lot of documentation that's going on and there's a lot of vetting that's happening. And again, you can look at this link. It's also in the Google Doc um, to see all of the vetting that's happening. Okay, so Ayan is in the US. She is here, she has arrived, she went through border control, everything is going great. And um, so who's in charge here? All right, at the federal level, we've got the Office of Refugee Resettlement and they're housed within um, the Department of Health and Human Services. And ORR works with state level refugee offices in Ohio. This is the name, Ohio Refugee Services. Um, and that is ORR funded. So that's not state funding that's paying for this. Um, and then at the local level, there are refugee resettlement agencies. And usually those are ORR and funded by other, um, other entities. I haven't been in Ohio long enough to check how their fund, how the local resettlement agencies funding models are working, but that's generally um, in my experience how this works. Okay, so Ayan's first days and actually prior to her first days, before she comes, her refugee resettlement agency, let's let's say that she's coming to Columbus, Ohio, okay? There, that um, in Columbus, there is going to be a caseworker who makes sure that Ayan has housing, furnishings, appliances, clothing, sheets, um, pillows, forks, knives, spoons, et cetera, food from the home country. There's actually a checklist of things that the Refugee Resettlement Agency needs to have in place for Ayan and her children's arrival. Then when Ayan and her children arrive at the airport, the resettlement worker meets them at the airport, drives them to their new home and sort of gives them an orientation to their home. There might be some things that are new to them, right? Like maybe they have a gas stove and Ayan hasn't worked with a gas stove before, right? Or I actually had students that I went to their home to visit them and I heard that the battery was beeping in their smoke detector and they didn't know where the noise was coming from or what it even meant, right? So those kinds of things might need to be explained. And then literally sometimes the next day, within a day or two, um, the resettlement worker comes back and sometimes interpreters are along um, and we're getting social security cards, registering kids for school, getting adults into English class, helping people navigate shopping, helping them figure out where to get culturally and linguistically appropriate medical care, um, and then jobs. And jobs tends to be very, very key um, for all of the refugees that I've worked with, all of my students, my former students. These are called nesting services and they last 30 days. Okay. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So what's next for Ayan? 
After six months, she needs to start repaying those travel loans. So it wouldn't be unheard of for a flight from Nairobi, Kenya to, you know, somewhere in the US like Columbus to be like a thousand dollars, right? So mo like a modest amount would be that. So let's assume on the modest scale that Ayan has um, a bill of about $4,000 she needs to start paying to start repaying. And then after one year, she's required to apply for legal permanent residency, what's called an AKA a green card. They're not green cards anymore, everyone. <laughs> but that's what that's what people have been called them. And she needs to do this. She needs to um, file this I-45, this adjustment of status form. I want to ask you to make a guess about how much you think it costs Ayan to apply to adjust status to legal permanent residency or LPR. Do you think that's around $50, 75? Maybe it's over a hundred, maybe it's 500. Okay, it's what right now it's $1,140 for her to do this. And so if she does this for all of her four family members, then they've got another bill of over $4,000 and it's a requirement to become a legal permanent resident. Okay, so obviously with these bills, a high priority for Ayan and for all of the students that I've worked with is, is getting a job as soon as possible. And this is actually written into the work of the ORR and the state level um, agencies as well. If you go into all of their documents, they're frequently talking about work. Okay, so true or false, after someone is resettled in the US, they're no longer considered a refugee. That would make sense, right? Like they're not, they're not really on the move anymore, they're here. Okay, I put this in purposely for my former students because they know that my favorite answer to every question is it depends. <laughs> so going back to this visual, when assuming everything goes well and Ayan's application to be a legal permanent resident is approved, there's no guarantee. It's not guaranteed, right? But assuming everything goes through um, and she and she's approved, at that point, her legal status changes in the United States. Her legal status is no longer refugee status, it's legal permanent resident status. So from a legal standpoint, the term refugee, in terms of her status, doesn't apply. However, I have had many friends and colleagues and students who have used the term refugee to describe themselves for many, many years. So I had a student who had been in the US for over 20 years and she said, oh, I'm a refugee. Okay, so I wanna honor the fact that even though a legal status might change, the experience of being a refugee is something that someone might carry with them. And then I've also had students and colleagues and friends who have, as soon as they got legal permanent resident status or sometime down the road after that, they said, this term no longer applies to me. I don't want this term attached to me any longer. So moving along, I'm going to, because of time, I'm going to skip how Ayan's process, no, I'll tell you, it's quick. How is Ayan's process different from an asylum seekers? Okay, so that's where asylum seekers landed on our little chart earlier, right? And we remember that the same definition um, applies for asylum seekers or refugees. The difference is that Ayan is here in Kenya and she's applying to go to the US where an asylum seeker would already be in the US and they would say, I need to seek asylum. So how could this happen? Simple example, this happened to actually to um, a friend. So when this friend was 10 years old, she and her family came to the US so that her mom could do her PhD, both of her parents actually doing a PH, doing PhDs in the United States. So mom and dad are doing PhDs in the United States, they're on student visas, and the two kids came along, my friend and um, her sibling. While they were here, there was a war broke out in their home country and there was a coup and it wasn't safe for them to go home anymore. So they're in the US, and they apply for, um, they, they um, seek asylum with the US government. So it, the process starts from within the country where you're seeking asylum. That That's what makes asylum different than the third country resettlement, which is what the process that we're talking about right now. If you think about for Ayan, she started in Somalia, she went to Kenya, US was her third country. So that's what we call third country resettlement. Okay. I've got a couple of um, little pieces of data for refugees in Ohio. There's just three questions and then we're done. So true or false, despite the decline in refugees admitted to the US since 2017, so the US is going like this, right? 
the overall numbers of refugees admitted to Ohio has consistently increased over the last 10 years. So that could happen, right? Federally, it's going like this, but our state is continuing to go up. Okay, so this is false. I'll show you what Ohio looks like. From 2010 to 2019, I created this graph based on data that I got from um, the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, which is where the refugee office is located in Columbus. And these are the numbers. So in 2019, um, around 1,500 refugees resettled, um, like went through the th third country process, um, third country resettlement process, sorry, um, and were resettled in Ohio. So that's a little bit lower than where we were at in 2010. But we did, you see, we sort of followed a similar pattern that the federal, the federal level did. And where that lands us, this number is, is off actually. I don't know where they got 1400 from, but it's close, it's close. We were actually at 1500. But that lands us in terms of raw numbers, you know, toward in, like in the top 10. But Texas, Washington, New York, California are, you know, common places that receive lot um, higher numbers and um, they account for, what is it, like maybe a fourth of the resettlement that happened in 2019. Okay, over the last 10 years, I, Ohio has welcomed refugees from how many countries? Do you think that they've come? Now, this is 10 years, so think back. So between 15 and 20 countries, 40 to 45 countries, or greater than 50. Okay, so greater than 50, quite a lot greater than 50. Um, I don't have the exact number, and the reason that I don't is because of this other category. For several years, um, the refugee office at the state level just reported other um, in the reports that are available publicly. And so I don't know what, how many countries are wrapped up in other. <laughs> but for the last 10 years, these are the top 10 countries of origin and the numbers of refugees that have been resettled in Ohio. So leading um, would be Bhutan, uh, Somalia, and Democratic Republic of Congo. All right, and the very last one is refugees are resettled in many counties throughout Ohio. Is that true or false? Are you just as likely to, um, is a refugee just as likely to be resettled in Columbus and Cleveland as they are to be resettled in, I don't know, a county close to me like Columbiana or Trumbull County or something? So the answer to this is false. Um, there are resettlement agencies in six cities in Ohio, and this is where they are, Toledo, Dayton, Cincinnati, Columbus, Akron, and Cleveland. And these, um, these are the organizations that are doing that work in those locations. And the, the, all this information, again, very easy to find online. <laughs> okay, and so this is a little recap of what we've looked at, definition of refugee, the processes, numerical trends, and how we line up compared to other countries and other states. And I left 10 minutes miraculously to do a little bit of Q&A. Um, so I would love to hear what kinds of questions people have. Since there's a slight delay in the live streaming and what we're doing here in WebEx, I'll start with a question while we wait for questions from the live audience. Can you tell us more about English education for adults and parents? What are some barriers and what leads to success? Yeah, so this is my area, right? Education. Um, so what I think one of the misconceptions that is out there sometimes is that um, folks um, are coming and, and don't desire to learn English. So that hasn't been my experience. Um, in fact, one of the things that I was charged to do in the job that I took that I referenced in 2001 was to deal with the very, very long waiting lists that existed. So frequently the, the demand for English classes outpaces supply. And um, so you, one of the things you'll see in cities that are receiving quite a few refugees is you'll see sort of these, what I call church basement programs pop up here and there, right? So um, faith communities, um, synagogues, churches, mosques will um, pop up their own um, just like on, you know, on Saturdays, come and take an English class or sometimes in libraries as well, you'll see these um, ad hoc English classes pop up. And so some of the barriers um, that folks face are, number one, transportation can be difficult. Um, that's one of the reasons that um, the resettlement programs tend to um, find housing in places where either refugees can walk to school 
or take buses or public transportation because getting a driver's license and having a car is out of reach, usually, not always, but usually out of reach at the beginning. Um, so transportation can be a big thing. And then work itself. So um, the folks that I've worked with have been so eager to have jobs and have like steady incomes and financial stability that sometimes they'll set aside English classes in order to take jobs. So <clears throat> um, one of the schools that I worked with um, in Atlanta um, was all women and it provided childcare and it was during the day. So it was very attractive because then women that had like little younger children, they could bring their kids with them to school. And it wasn't uncommon for someone to just stop coming if they, you know, if a job opened for them at the chicken factory. And part of me was like, that's wonderful. I'm so glad for you that you're meeting your goals. <laughs> and part of me was like, ah, if you could stick with it for two to five more years, your English proficiency would be higher and you'd be able, maybe it's likely that you would be able to get a job that maybe had more pay. You might have more options for yourself out on the job market. So, yeah. Going back to the graph with variations on refugee caps and admissions, could you tell us more about why some of those ups and downs occurred? So I'm ready for this question. And um, I actually have a, another graph to show you. Um, and let's see if I can find it. Here it is. Um, so usually the fluctuations that we see in, in, term, in terms of admissions, actually, this isn't the one. Uh, that's not the one either. Okay. So, oh, no, this is actually the one thing. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, there tend to be fluctuations primarily because of two things. One, there are political things that happen within the country, of course. Number two, what's happening around the world, right? When there, If there's a big um, displacement related to war, um, then so, some countries might stand up to the plate, like the United States might stand up to the plate and say, okay, well, um, you know, we're here at our cap, but we're only on track to get up to here but okay, we're gonna go higher. We're not gonna go over our cap. Again, that only happened that I could find two times since 1980. But um, but they can see, like officials can see what they're on track for and they might, they might go higher in terms of admissions. So you can see here over the course of time, some of the things that, um, that happened politically. So like in 1989, you, the US raised quotas on, so, on um, refugees from the former Soviet Union. And so there was an increase in folks from Europe. Um, let's see, in 99, you might remember things that were going on in Kosovo and we were you know, receiving refugees from there. So you see these ups and downs related to um, international conditions as well as domestic conditions. Yeah. And we have a question from Facebook. Can you tell us how many refugees arrived in 2020? So 2020 isn't done yet. <laughs> so no, I can't. <laughs> um, and I was not able to, um, I wasn't able to put my hands on, on arrival data. And I think that part of that is because um, they're not making it public yet. In fact, the, the the largest amount of data I was able to put my hands on was 2018. I think that there might be some delays in getting 2019 data out even. So unfortunately, no, I can't, sorry. Okay, and another question from Rachel on Facebook. Nicole, I know the Ohio federal government offices for green card interviews, et cetera, have been closed due to COVID. I wonder what will happen to the asylum seekers still waiting to move forward with their residency status here. Yeah, I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately. Um, again, that is the type of question that would be great for someone who <coughs> on a daily basis doing this work. So the immigration lawyers that are working with those folks on a day-to-day -day basis would have a really good handle on, on what's going on related to COVID. So I, I apologize, I don't have an answer for that one. Okay, and we know there's a lot you couldn't include in your presentation due to time. Do you think there's any other demographic information that our audience might be interested in? Yeah, so I um, I thought I, I, I prepared another slide. Here we go. I thought I thought folks might be interested in this. 
So this is um, this is a graph of the number of refugees entering the U.S. by religious affiliation. And so um, what you've got here in the red is unknown. And so it looks like our unknown numbers stopped fairly soon. This starts, I'm sorry, this starts in 2002 and it goes to 2019. And then um, the dark blue is unaffiliated. The light blue is other. The yellow is Christian and the gold is Muslim. Um, and I had a note. Let's see, what did my note say that I wanted to point out here to you all? Um, I think one of the things to be noted is that the number starting in 2017, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the number of Christians um, is higher than any other group starting in 2017. Um, and in terms of the balance between Christian and Muslim, that has been, you know, somewhat on par. Um, from you know the 2013 through 2016 years, but then also the number of Christians was also higher or on par um, earlier than that as well. I think sometimes there's a misperception that everyone that's coming in is of certain religious backgrounds, and um, that's it. There's there are, there's some fluctuations, and of course we. You know, now that we've seen the priority that was put in place this year that wasn't a regional priority, but a religious priority that might shift going forward in 2020, we might see some shifts. Um, we might see some shifts here, um, but just overall, there's been more balance than I think um, folks realize. And back to Facebook for a question from Lindsay. Is there a need for more volunteers or workers related to refugees, both domestic and internationally? Yes. <laughs> um, if you wanted to get involved, Lindsay, um, I, Lindsay said that she was located in the Youngstown area earlier on Facebook. Probably the closest place um, to do volunteer work would be somewhere in Akron. And so, um, Unless you're frequently in Cleveland or Pittsburgh, because Pittsburgh also has refugee, you know, quite a bit of refugee resettlement, a very active refugee resettlement community, um, it would be to reach out to one of those resettlement agencies and ask them how you uh, might be able to volunteer, how your family might be able to volunteer. Um, in terms of the international scope, I'm not sure what's going on right now with COVID and um, how to get involved internationally, but there are a number of NGOs that, I'm sorry, non-governmental organizations, I'm trying not to use acronyms, um, that do this work and um, like the Inter um, International Rescue Committee, you might want to reach out to them. Um, World Relief, you might want to reach out to them. So, yeah. And another question, um, sometimes we don't know the backgrounds of people that are in the public eye. Are there any well-known figures that were refugees or asylees? Let me tell you, I wonder if I have a slide for this. <laughs> This is a great question. That's one of the images I decide. Oh, here it is. I do. Okay, these are just four. Okay, so there, the list is quite long. Albert Einstein, no introduction needed. Okay, um, <clears throat> he was foundational in the forming of International Rescue Committee. Madeleine Albright, the first female US Secretary of State. We like that, or I do anyway. <laughs> um, I can never remember if her name is pronounced Mila or Mila Kunis. For those of you who are younger, I looked for someone who is younger. <laughs> well known for being the partner of Ashton Kutcher and for her illustrious um, career. Her, um, she is originally from the Ukraine. Um, and Sergey Brin, who's the co-founder of Google. So um, there are quite a few immigrant and refugee um, owned, begun businesses um, like Google, for example, um, that are providing lots and lots of jobs and um, lots of benefits to the US economy. So I wanted to point out, I think that a lot of the images that we see, like you saw in that, the thing I didn't want to show for very long, <laughs> um, tend to be these images of large masses of people, you know, moving all together. We don't really see faces. There are no names, um, people that are in destitute conditions. And I just, um, I think it's important to um, make sure that we're representing the full gamut of um, human experience. So um, there are folks who come and um, many who put their own businesses. In fact, um, I don't have, this is one of the ones that I don't have the data at hand with me, but I will put it in the Google 
I'll put it in the Google Doc, a link so you can check on me to make sure that I'm telling the truth, which you should do, <laughs> information literacy, <laughs> um, that um, the incidence of um, beginning and owning businesses amongst immigrant and refugee populations um, was higher in the report that I read than the um, native born population. Um, and I, if you're interested in like, how does all of this stuff work with the economy? I would really encourage, um, I would really encourage you to find a way to hear from some economists on that point because there's some really interesting stuff going on there. Yeah. And a final question. You talked a little about the support refugees receive when they first come to the US. Can you tell us how long that lasts and what other kind of support is available? Yeah, so um so the nesting services, those that I talked about with like making sure people have housing and um, their social security cards, et cetera, um, the nesting services last for 30 days. And then um, there is a provision to, in certain cases, um, to ask for permission for those to, to be extended um, up to, I believe, 90 days. But the link for that information to make sure that I'm remembering correctly, again, it's in the Google Doc. That's why I know that it's okay because I have all this stuff backed up and you all can check on it too. There's also something called refugee cash assistance and refugee medical assistance. Those are for um, the first eight months after arrival. And then um, depending on who is in the family group and what's going on, like, you know, some folks arrive, um, um, you know, with fewer savings than others. Like some, some might arrive, you know, with large amounts of savings, if they have been, there are, there are refugees that come that have been wealthy, right? So it's not just people that are, you know, financially in difficult situations. Um, so um, those folks wouldn't qualify for what I'm going to talk about or middle class, right? Um, wouldn't qualify for what I'm talking about. But for, for folks that are um, um, in, um, have a more tenuous financial situation. Um, they could be eligible for, you know, Medicaid, TAMP, the tempor temporary assistance for needy families or food stamps, all of the same kinds of um, like constraints and limitations and benefits and everything that are in place for US citizens are also in place. So it's, it's not like someone who comes with refugee status, you know, gets food stamps and they get them much longer than anyone else, or they get the, they get the TAMP much longer than anyone else. It's the same as you would get if you were a US citizen. And then there's, there's social services for up to five years, some, you know, job and language training, employment counseling, but it really depends on what's in place in the city that they're resettled and also, um, like what the waiting lists look like and, you know, if it's linguistically accessible. This is one of the things is that, you know, there, there might be training in place, but what languages is it being provided in? And is it one of the languages that you speak or is it only in English? And if it's only in English, what's your English level? So language is key. And of course, that's my career. So I think that. <laughs> well, Dr. Pettit, thank you so much for your insight into what refugees face and the many facets of resettlement. Are there any closing comments you'd like to add? No, just I'd like to thank everyone for being here and for participating. And I really encourage you to go and take a look at that Google Doc I'm going to be adding to it. There's some spots down below that say books and films, and I just didn't get to that yet. And so Google Docs are dynamic, so you'll see that I'll be adding to that. So I encourage you to, to go back and, and take a look. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. If you have further questions for Dr. Pettit, her contact information will appear in the Facebook comments shortly. And we invite you to join us for the next alumni lecture series program, which will take place on Thursday, June 4th at noon, when Dr. Philip Randall, Randall will discuss whole life planning. He'll give us tips on money, health, work, and leisure. So we hope you'll join us. Thank you for attending this evening and good night.